Uh, to His Excellency Governor Hurley, uh, to Chief Scientist Hugh Durant White, to the Royal Society and the four academies, thank you for the invitation to share my ideas with such esteemed colleagues today. Uh, my name is Ashley Brunson. I'm the Executive Director at the Warren Center for Advanced Engineering at University of Sydney. On a morning that is focused on sustainability, it's certainly appropriate to acknowledge the first peoples of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, who have practiced sustainable custodianship of this beautiful land for 10,000 years. Yeah, yeah. The Warren Center believes basic science informs fundamental engineering. When engineers turn their minds towards human needs and practice human-centered design, new technologies leap from laboratories to cross the threshold of successful commercial innovation. Superior new products and processes serve the market of the 25 million people in Australia and then move overseas to build economic impact in the global market of 7 billion people. This cycle of innovation builds wealth and prosperity for Australians. It builds a high quality of life. Experts who study systems of innovation know that the communities that practice this well build competitive economies that spiral upwards in the global knowledge economy, providing sustainable jobs, strong local enterprises, and prosperity. The Warren Center works to support this cycle for Sydney, for New South Wales, and for Australia. This is our vision, and today's forum is highly aligned to our mission. Engineers don't always do policy. Uh, but the Warren Center works to bring industry, government, and academia together to create thought leadership in engineering, technology, and innovation. We constantly challenge economic, legal, environmental, social, and political paradigms to open possibilities for innovation and technology to build a better future. Our 35 years experience, and that's four years of my experience, 35 years from Ron Johnston and Dick Kell and Mike Duro who are here today, that experience of leading the conversation through projects, promotion, and independent advice drives Australian entrepreneurship and economic growth. We're currently working with Professor Jose Torero and Professor Peter Shergold to address gaps in fire safety engineering for complex buildings. Uh, Professor Torero will return to Sydney on February 5th to share insights from his expert testimony in the Grenfell Tower inquiry nine days ago in London, uh, and he will present uh, among two research papers in our current fire safety engineering project. Um, as a first year chemical engineer, Professor Rousseau taught me the first and most fundamental law of chemical engineering. Mass in minus mass out equals accumulation. Uh, the steady state economy in the previous uh, presentation and this idea of accumulation are perfectly correlated. Chemical engineers, and indeed all industrial engineers from the 20th century, have created a problem that I call the accumulation problem. Uh, we are accumulating waste. Electronic waste accumulates in the laneways behind our offices. The production process is linear. Extract raw materials, build parts, assemble machines, sell to consumers, landfill obsolescent goods. The profitability equations are also linear. Increased sales revenue requires more raw material extraction, faster product redesign cycles, faster obsolescence. Increased profit is correlated to increased extraction and increased landfill waste. Plastics that were engineered for the remarkable chemical stability of their polymer molecules are accumulating in our oceans and on our beaches. In an often cited statistic, the current rate of accumulation of plastic in the oceans will lead to a day in the middle of this century when the mass of all the plastic in the oceans is greater than the mass of the fishes in the oceans. The accumulation problem is real. The circular economy is an idea that linear processes should be turned into a circular cycle, a cycle of distribution, use, reuse, repair, collection, sorting, and recycling. This is much more than just recycling, though. It requires a fundamental redesign of our products and production processes. The concepts are fuzzy and emerging. This diagram is one conception of the circular economy. This figure eight diagram is another conception that imagines a separate biosphere of agriculture, 
fresh water systems, sanitary waste, and fertilizers connected to industrial production processes that produce energy, use water, produce chemicals, and manufacture goods in urban, suburban, and industrial land use environments. Within these conceptualizations, recurrent themes broadly define the circular economy. The remanufacturing economy refurbishes, upgrades, and redeploys used goods. Instead of owning the Xerox photocopier, hardware is serviced continuously by the copier company. Instead of purchasing consumable ink cartridges, the contract delivers photocopies on demand at a variable cost. Ownership transforms towards a services economy. New business models of the share economy become relevant. Why buy a car when you can call a taxi? Why dedicate the capital of a yellow taxi car if car owners share their capital on Uber, Lyft, Ola, or if drivers share in the car next door or go-get schemes that operate in Sydney today? Ready-go, O-Bike, Mobike, and Lime mobile phone apps enable on-demand use of dockless bicycles and e-bikes. Local manufacturing, local remanufacturing, distributed manufacturing technologies like 3D printing, and local food production are themes within the broader circular economy discussion. The first step is industrial aggregation, <coughs> connecting head to tail in the bio and techno spheres Integrated suppliers and consumers are co-located to gain economies of scope and economies of scale in materials and energy efficiency. Here's a case study. The Kallenburg, Denmark Eco-Industrial Park developed between the 1960s and the early 1990s. A 1.5 gigawatt coal-fired power plant produces electricity and steam. Statoil Petroleum Refinery supplies natural gas and uses water uses waste steam for reboilers. Pharmaceutical supplier Novo Nordisk integrates with freshwater fish farms, yeast processing, and the city of Kallenburg sanitary wastewater processing to supply fertilizer sludge to off-site land agricultural users. Giprock is integrated with the coal-fired power station, and fly ash from the coal power station feeds an eco-park Portland cement manufacturer. Elements of the head-to-tail recycling are being tested in Australia, but the scale of Collenberg's industrial integration is far beyond domestic Australian industrial co-location and integration. Uh, Professor Ali Abbas, that's his smiling face, at the University of Sydney School of Chemical Engineering has demonstrated some coal fly ash cement technology that incorporates flue gas, carbon dioxide, and to cement carbonates to reduce CO2 emissions yielding cement with compressive strength substantially equivalent to conventional cement kiln products. Last weekend, Ali hosted the Australian Circular Economy Conference at Coinda Waters, Central Coast, New South Wales. Nanyang Technology University, Singapore, Tsinghua University, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, University of California, Santa Barbara, and UTS participated. New South Wales Department of, Ener of Industry, ICAMI, and Engineers Australia participated. The World Economic Forum Beijing and from industry Suez, Downer, and Dow Chemical participated. Ali shared new insights with me on Monday. I said, uh, how did it go? What are the big ideas? And he said, Ashley, it's not just recycling. He says, we've got to redesign everything. He said, look around you. Everything you see has to be redesigned. Uh, advanced manufacturing, longevity, reuse, and repurposing are key. Uh, these are Ali's cement pellets. But it's not just enough to recycle. We've got to design advanced manufacturing processes to produce customized high-value components. In Scotland, McReber Company is replacing petroleum tars and asphalt with pelletized recycled plastic. It's not just burying plastic into asphalt material. Recycling is necessary, but alone it is not sufficient. On Fridays, the Warren Center publishes a weekly innovation newsletter called The Prototype. We spotlight examples of Australian innovators who are designing the future, inventing new processes, and commercializing successful businesses in the circular economy, among other topics. This 2018 story shows how recycled plastics are converted to diesel fuel and clean hydrogen gas. Multiple successive five-year plans by China feature increasing commitment to the circular economy. 
Hu Jintao was an electrical engineer. Xi Jinping is a chemical engineer lawyer. On matters of industrial development, the Chinese Communist Party is an evidence-based, scientifically driven technocracy. When Shanghai bans free plastic shopping bags, the change is immediate with high compliance and no turning back. The speed of industrial reform is fast. Integrated industrial aggregation features prominently in the Suzhou Industrial Park and Tianjin Park. In 2017, China's national sword policy prohibited the import of plastic waste starting this year in 2018. That policy has caused shocks in the US, Japan, and Germany. Indeed, it has shocked Australia. Plastics are diverted now to Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam, but hundreds of millions of tons of plastic are stranded globally, and local solutions are needed. Redesign is critical. The economy must be restructured from a linear economy to a circular economy, as the European Commission Vice President stated in 2015. Mercedes-Benz, and indeed the whole German manufacturing industry, is redesigning products for maintenance, service, <coughs> refurbishment, remanufacturing, and redeployment. DIN standards and ISO standards are being written by and led by nations that are adopting the circular economy. The first phase was industrial aggregation. The next two phases are industrial design reform and the transition from product sales towards lease, service, and share economy business models. Each year, the Warren Center features a prominent Australian innovator in our annual innovation lecture. Professor Andrew Harris has developed one of the world's largest 3D printers, an invention conceived in Australia and deployed in England to produce mass-customized wax forms for concrete acoustic tiles in the London underground. Andrew stands with one foot in industry, leading Lang O'Rourke's Engineering Excellence Playground of New Technologies, and one foot in academia at the University of Sydney. At our 2017 Innovation Lecture, he described how digital design tools yield infinitely and easily customizable production with sensors built into products and sensors built into infrastructure that allow machine learning to capitalize on AI efficiencies. The plastic printed car by Local Motors is another example of digital customization and local manufacturing. Distributed manufacturing and remanufacture, me, remanufacturing further enable refurbishment in situ and new share economy and lease business models like the photocopier example I mentioned before. The Germans believe that jobs displaced by robot factory automation might be implemented, might be supplemented by new labor demand in maintenance and refurbishment. But Apple has a different idea about robotics. On a capital market basis, Apple is the wealthiest company on the planet. When Tim Cook is not chastising Mark Zuckerberg for breaching your data privacy, he's talking up sustainable electronics manufacturing. Apple plans for 100% renewable energy in all of its facilities. Its iPhone XR contains 30%, 32% of its plastic as bioplastic. In May, Apple announced co-financing for a zero-carbon aluminum smelting pilot process with Rio Tinto Alcan. With 2 billion iOS devices produced and released by Apple, Apple is part of the e-waste accumulation problem. In 2016, Apple demonstrated Liam, a robot that disassembles iPhones for recycling parts. Not only robot factory assembly, but now product disassembly is occurring by robots. Liam's daughter robot is Daisy, the next generation of iPhone crackers featured in this slide. Daisy is recovering sufficient tin metal that Apple hopes it can close loops and discontinue tin mine extraction in the future. Presently, the circular economy is an idea that is being promoted. In the UK, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation catalyzes thought leadership in this space. The universities are active here in Sydney, and we observe engagement and aspiration from tech companies like Apple. Ecological cooperation reached an international pinnacle at the 2015 Paris Conference. Perhaps today's forum here in Sydney is an indication that aspirations continue to rise. I see a convergence of thought that is social, political, and tech-led within sustainability. Technologists are politically active today, using digital media platforms to influence social attitudes. At the University of Sydney, Marianne Large, Andrew Harris, and Ron Johnston 
built a program called Invent the Future. PhD candidates from science, engineering, business, and design faculties collaborate to imagine a new product or service innovation to commercialize. The BioKite Carapac team developed the bioplastic <coughs> film in this slide. Company CEO Michelle Demers hopes to sell this plastic made from polymerized recycled seafood shells to mushroom farmers to displace petroleum plastic packaging. I don't know if this compostable plastic wrap will succeed in the market. I don't know if Michelle Demers and her company will succeed at the business venture, but I do believe strongly that this rising generation has the aspiration to solve the so-called wicked problems that we face. Based on solid science and the precautionary principle, a significant influential segment of the professional technical community sees the impact of the accumulation problems of e-waste and plastics. They use social, political, technology convergence to influence public opinion and business decisions. On June 8th this year, the Thailand Department of Marine and Coastal Resources uploaded photographs of a whale autopsy onto Facebook. Eighty plastic bags were in the belly of the dead whale. Three weeks before, McDonald's USA voted down a proposal to discontinue single-use plastic straws. Four weeks after the incident, Starbucks announced phase-out of single-use plastics. I call this the David Attenborough effect. Facebook shapes public opinion and business decisions. Mothers and children love whales. That photograph associates plastic with death. The day after, my Facebook feed had images of floating plastic garbage patches in the Dominican Republic. Hashtag straws suck began trending. Donald Trump tweets that climate change is a hoax, but a rising generation of young people push back. A few days ago, photographs of a 9.5 meter dead whale from Wakatobi National Park in Indonesia were distributed. Six kilos of plastic from hundreds of plastic cups and plastic bags were in the dead animal's belly. The cause of death is unknown, but the association of death with plastics is irresistible. Now that picture is the same picture from the previous slide, but have a look at it again and see that it is sort of the iris of an eye. Looking forward, this convergence of social, political, and tech factors could yield significant alignment for a trigger point, a tipping point. This will be obvious when governments begin to use the words of economists to justify legislation and regulation to implement the circular economy. I didn't get the KPS diagrams in the steady state economy discussion either, but moving to economic discussion and redefining old models of economics that don't work is occurring. Governments are massive purchasers. Secondary materials markets are currently insufficient for, for recycled materials. I'll come back, back to microplastics in a moment, but New South Wales has released a circular economy policy statement. There is progress now in New South Wales. In the meantime, plastics show up everywhere, and the images frame spoiled natural beauty, ruination of the ocean, and death to fishes. It is a public relations challenge for the plastics industry, but these materials in their macro form are not toxic to humans. However, eroded microplastics are appearing in the human food chain. Table salt from China, fish, saltwater oysters, and freshwater mussels have shown microplastics contamination. Strict curbside waste segregation recycling Germany is recovering kitchen vegetable and fruit waste to municipal composting programs, but plastics are entering that compost and appearing in fertilizer supplied to German farms. The latest story from a few weeks ago was a paper presented at a gastroenterology conference not yet published in a peer-reviewed journal. That work included tests from six European countries plus Japan that showed microplastics in human feces. We are what we eat and we are eating plastics. I do not know of published studies showing harm from human ingestion of microplastics, but it has been said that plastics might preferentially absorb low concentration organic pollutants like benzenes in the environment, concentrate them on lipophilic surface tension, and transfer organic pollutants into human food chains. This is speculative, but it is being reported. 
In conclusion, there's plenty of evidence to make the case for redesigning industries and products to align towards the circular economy. I foresee increasing public opinion alignment towards these possibilities, especially due to the political, social, digital, technology influences. Some businesses are re-engineering themselves to align with the aspirations, and a new generation of consumers and customers are aligning their expectations. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak and to share ideas this morning.